apologize for the sound system. We're having a few difficulties with it. They're trying to get it worked out. But uh, regardless, we're going to continue anyways. What I'd like you to do this morning is to open your Bibles up to Second Chronicles. Let's go to the book of Second Chronicles. And I want you to go to chapter 20. I find that chapter 20 is probably one of my most favorite chapters in the Bible. It clearly speaks volumes, especially when it comes to prayer and to praise. And I want to focus in on a certain prayer that King Jehoshaphat said and how God responded to this man's prayer. So before we get going, let's go to him, our master, and seek his guidance for this morning. Amen? Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that you're still God. You will always be God. You're the God of Jehoshaphat, the God of David, the God of Solomon, of the disciples, and you're our God. We praise you and we thank you. Father, this morning as we come into your presence, I ask, Father God, only that I be moved out of the way and let the Holy Spirit have his perfect way so that, Father, I may deliver to these people, Father, that which you have given to me to share with them that will enhance their prayer life. In the name of Jesus, amen. The passage I want to look at in particular is 1 through 12 to begin with, but I'm not going to read every verse. I'm just going to concentrate on a couple. First of all, a little bit of a background. King Jehoshaphat is, uh, is, the, is the, uh, the heir of, of uh, King Asa, and uh, he's quite a, quite a king. We hear a lot about King David. We hear a lot about his exploits and the great things that he did. And truly he did. And he was a powerful, powerful, powerful man of God. He was a, he was a man, a king who wasn't afraid of anything. He wasn't, a, he wasn't a, a defeatist. He didn't believe in having a defeatist attitude. He made his mistakes just like all of us. But in reading the scriptures and going through the Chronicles and the Kings, I absolutely fell in love with this man named King Jehoshaphat because King Jehoshaphat was so honest and so real about everything that he did. And in chapter 20 we find that there's been a plot has been made against the people of Judah and against the king. Verse 1 says, Now it came about after this that the sons of Joab and the sons of Ammon together with some of the Munanites came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, out of Armin. And behold, they are in Hazanatamar, that is, in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord, and they even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. These first four verses I find are extremely fascinating. First of all, King Jehoshaphat is showing something. He's showing his humanity. He's showing the fact that he went to God. He was honest to God. He said, look, I'm afraid. The man had a little fear. He wasn't afraid to admit it to God. But he did the one thing that every Christian on this earth should do when facing a great trial or something coming against them, and that's to seek the Lord. He knew where to go to and whom to go to when problems came upon him. Amen? And then it said that Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of the people, and of course he began to say this great prayer. And he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, art thou not God in the heaven? Art thou not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in thy hand, so that no one can stand against thee. You see, right off the bat here in, in verse 6, we find that he's giving acknowledgement to the Lord God Almighty. When Jesus taught us the, the sample prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He was glorified. What he was telling us there was to glorify and acknowledge who God is and to bring glory to his name. Amen? Because only God is God. And that's what he's doing here. He's saying, O Lord, the God of our fathers, art thou not God in the heavens? He's acknowledging the fact that, are you not the only God in heaven? Well, of course he's the only God of heaven. But he had to acknowledge this to God. He had to confess this. Verse 7. Didst thou not, our, o our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and give it to the descendants of Abraham, thy friend, forever? Here he's 
reminding God of the exploits that he did, the things that God did in the past for Israel. He drove people out. He drove uh, inhabitants out of the land that Israel was to possess. He did great and mighty things. Verse 8, And they lived in it, and have built thee a sanctuary there for thy name, saying, Should evil come upon us, the sword, or judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before thee, for thy name is in this house, and, and cry to thee in our distress. Thou wilt hear and deliver us. And now, behold the sons of Ammon, and Moab, and Mount Seir, whom thou didst not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. Verse 11, Behold how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out from thy possession, which thou hast given us as our inheritance. Now I want to stop right here because I, I said, forgive me for the sound thing. But I want to focus a little bit here on verse 12. I find verse 12 is a most fascinating verse, especially when it comes to prayer. Because Jehoshaphat is letting the people know that there's something happening in prayer. When, when you hear this, look what he does. Look what he does. Verse 12, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we are powerless for this great multitude who are coming against us. Nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are on thee. And of course, verse 13, And all Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. Now the first thing I want to see about verse 12 is the fact that he admitted that he was powerless. He admitted to God and before the people, I'm powerless over this situation. And then the second thing he admitted is, I don't know what to do. He is showing God and revealing to God, I'm weak in this area. I just don't know what to do in this situation. I feel hopeless. And then he goes on and he says, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on thee. Here again, as I stated earlier, the one thing that he does is he turns away from the fear, he turns away from the knowledge that he doesn't know what to do, to the one thing that he doesn't know what to do. He focuses his eyes and attention upon God. He knew where to go to for help. He knew who to go to for help. Let us continue. Now we're going to find out that his prayer is about to be answered by a man named Jehaziel. And I find this interesting because I've been in the military, as I'm sure that a lot of you have been in the military. And when it comes to military action and military warfare, what God now tells them to do is something that is just not heard of or used today in military actions. In fact, if you, if you went to the military and said to them today, uh, this is what I want you to do. I want you to, to go out and sing songs before uh, the, the army uh, takes over. They would laugh you right out, of, right out of the Pentagon. They'd laugh you out of every fort. They would laugh you out of the world, period. But listen, this didn't happen here. Jehoshaphat answers the prayer. Verse 14, Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Beniah, and the son of Eel, and the son of Mataniah, and the Levite of the son of Esau. And he said, Listen, all of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, Do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. He's letting them know right off Jump Street, this is not your battle to fight. Why are you afraid? What do you mean you don't know what to do? This battle is not yours. It's God. God saying, I got this. You don't have to worry. Let's go on. Verse 16, Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley, in the front of the wilderness of Jerob. He's already letting them know where they're going to be. He's a spot. Amen. Praise God. Now, verse 17. Look here again. You need not fight. They didn't have to bring out a sword. They didn't have to clench their fists. They didn't have to do anything in this battle. Station yourselves. That's all they had to do. Station yourselves and stand. You know what it means to station yourself to stand? You see, back in those days, I've done a little research on, on military warfare in the past, is what they had to do. They, I don't know what kind of shoes they had, but I do know the types of, of, of sandals and shoes that the Romans had. They had little spikes in them, and of course they would plant themselves. They would plant their feet right there and take a stand against the enemy. 
because this helps prevent you from falling or from going backwards or sideways or forwards. It keeps you firm-footed so that you pick up those swords and that, and that shield, you know, you can do battle the way you're supposed to do. Amen? Alright, so this is what God is showing you. God is showing you, you need not fight in this battle. Station yourself. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. Now, the people of Jerusalem, of Judah at that time, of Jehovah, they knew this was from God. Because look at what happened in verse 80. Look at their reaction. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. See, you know when you get a word from the Lord, because automatically you will go to your knees, and you will fall before God, and you will worship Him. You will get excited. For example, this morning I was studying out of Isaiah chapter 54, and I began to look at verse 17 very carefully, and all of a sudden I just knew that what God was sharing with me in there was from Him. And I stopped, and I bowed before the Lord, and I worshipped Him. Now, he goes on down. Look at verse 19. The Levites from the sons of the Kohanites and the sons of Korites stood up to praise, to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. Hallelujah! Okay, they weren't afraid to give praise. Now, what God wanted them to do, we're going to jump down here to about the middle of verse 20. Put your trust in the Lord, your God. And you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. Verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire as they went out before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And when they began singing and praising the Lord, the Lord set ambushes against all of those that had come against them. That's my paraphrase. You see, what God had told them to do, you don't have to do a thing. All you have to do is give thanks to me and give praise. You just have to praise God. Look what happened to Jericho when they began to praise and they began to shout. And here again, they're also talking about shout to the Lord. Amen? In fact, there's a song many years ago uh, that, that I remember uh, playing when I was a, a worship leader. It said that His loving kindness is everlasting. And I can just imagine when, when people were singing this in Israel at this time in Judah, what it must have sounded like to have thousands upon thousands of people singing, His loving kindness is everlasting. Amen? Give thanks to the Lord our God. You just can imagine in your mind what this must sound like. Then there was a song later on that I learned by the same group called, Oh, praise the Lord, oh my soul, praise the Lord. That's all they did. They just sang very simple lyrics. They didn't have a lot of bridges and stanzas and everything else to go to like we do today. They just sang simple melodies, but they did it out of their heart because they did it as the Holy Spirit led them. And when they obeyed God and did exactly what God told them to do, they had victory, they had success, and they were able to defeat the enemy. But what about you today? Are you willing to give God the praise? Are you willing to give God the thanks? Are you willing to give God the honor and the glory that is due His name? I pray so, because when you do, and you give Him praise and you thank Him, you're going to find that you're going to have a whole lot of victories in this earth. God bless you.